Hello, and welcome to the Atlas Agency, where we investigate the Arkham Horror Living Card Game. Over the last several months, I've been doing spotlight videos exploring the contents of the six Mythos Pack expansions of the Dunwich Legacy Cycle. Today, I'm stepping back to finally look at the Dunwich Legacy Deluxe Expansion, the box that kicked off this whole Dunwich Legacy Cycle. There's a lot of content to cover here, including five new investigators, three new basic weaknesses, 21 new player cards, and two new scenarios. I'll be tackling all of that in this video in that order, investigators, weaknesses, player cards, and finally my spoiler-free impressions of these scenarios. It's a lot to cover, so let's get to it. There are five new investigators in the Dunwich Deluxe box. That's one for each of the game's five classes. Now, in the core set, each of the investigators had a primary class where they could use the class's full card pool, any level, plus a secondary class where they were restricted to just cards that were level 0, 1, or 2. The five new investigators in the Dunwich box don't follow that pattern. They still have primary classes, but they don't have secondary classes. Instead, each of them is allowed to take up to five level 0 cards from any other combination of classes. It's a neat twist. It gives you a ton of freedom over a very small part of your deck. You can do a lot of agonizing over filling those five out of faction slots, but then you're bound a lot more narrowly than the core set investigators for your remaining 25 cards. Like the core set investigators, each of the Dunwich investigators comes with two signature cards, one that's helpful and then a signature weakness. Each also gets one random basic weakness during uh, deck building or initial deck building. On the whole, these investigators are a lot of fun to play with and also to deck build for. I'm going to introduce each of the new investigators, including their signature cards, and then I'll offer some commentary on each of them. We'll start with our guardian investigator, Zoe Samaris, the chef. Zoe's top stats are her combat and her willpower. She's got four willpower, two intellect, four combat, and two agility. Her traits are believer and hunter. Her main ability is a reaction that triggers after you become engaged with an enemy, causes her to gain one resource. Her elder sign effect gives her plus one to the skill test, and then if the test is successful during an attack, it deals plus one damage. And then she has nine health and six sanity. Let's go ahead and take a look at the back side of the card. Uh, these five investigators, their deck building options and requirements are all essentially the same. There is one exception, which we'll get to, but it's a deck size of 30. So we can take guardian cards level 0 to 5, neutral cards level 0 to 5, and up to 5 level 0 cards from any other class. Her deck building requirements are just her two signature items and then one random basic weakness. Her signature card, Zoe's Cross, is a one cost asset that occupies her accessory slot, has a reaction ability that triggers after an enemy becomes engaged with you. You can exhaust the cross and spend one resource to deal one damage to that enemy. Keep in mind Zoe's special ability is to gain resources when enemies engage with her, so you'll always have that one resource available to spend on this. You'll often just be gaining the resource and immediately spending it to fuel the cross. This is a great signature card. It's probably one of my favorite signature cards. Bonus damage is always great. The ability to just drop a damage on an enemy just for engaging it uh, is, is fantastic if you can get it into play. Then we have Zoe's signature weakness, Smite the Wicked. This is a treachery and its revelation effect causes you to discard cards from the top of the encounter deck until an enemy is discarded. Then you attach Smite the Wicked to that enemy and spawn it at the location farthest from Zoe. It's got a forced effect that gives Zoe one mental trauma if that enemy is still in play when the game ends. This can be really swingy. In Dunwich, there are a couple of scenarios where this is either no problem at all or very bad, depending on which enemy you hit and where you're at in the scenario when it comes up. A lot of the time, it's neither. You'll get an enemy and you'll have to deal with it, but since Zoe's pretty well equipped to deal with enemies, it's not a problem. I think it's worst when you also draw enemies during the Mythos phase. Sometimes that leads to your group getting overwhelmed, and that's cost me scenarios. I really enjoy playing Zoe. She's a really focused investigator. She just wants to kill monsters, and she's pretty good at it. I think she's really the best fighter in the game at this point. You pair her up with a good clue gatherer, and you've got a solid team. As I said, her special item, the cross, is very nice. I also like her Elder Sign ability. Some of the Elder Sign abilities that just give you a skill boost tend to not matter, since unless you're desperate, ordinarily you're not doing tests where you need better than a zero to pass. But Zoe's Elder Sign can make a real difference. I've had it come up and let me kill an enemy in one attack when I was planning for it to take two. You can't count on it. Uh, you never know when it's going to show up, but it can be helpful when it happens. Zoe's going to struggle in solo to gather clues with her intellect of two. 
Some people, I think, try to shore that up by using her five out-of-action slots to bring in, like, the mystic spell that lets you use your willpower to gather clues. So he's got a four willpower, so that can work. I prefer, though, to just run her in multiplayer, let her focus on what she does best, and have someone else in there to, uh, to get the clues for her. Our new seeker is Rex Murphy, the reporter. Three willpower, four intellect, two combat, and three agility. Has the reporter trait. After you succeeded a skill test by two or more while investigating, discover one clue at your location. His Elder Sign effect gives you plus two, or you may instead choose to automatically fail the skill test to draw three cards. So that's always a fun temptation to have to deal with. Six health and nine sanity. I'll also show the back of his card. He is mostly the same as the other Dunwich investigators as far as his deck building requirements, but he has one extra line here. That's the deck building restriction that he's not allowed to use any fortune cards. This is because Rex's backstory is that he is cursed, so no fortune cards for him. Rex's signature card is Search for the Truth. This is a one resource event that lets you draw X cards, where X is the number of clues on Rex Murphy, to a maximum of five also has two intellect icons and a wild icon. So a pretty straightforward card drawing event, but nice to have. His weakness is a little more complicated. It is Rex's curse. Its revelation effect puts it into play in your threat area, has a forced effect that triggers when you would succeed at a skill test, causes you to return the revealed chaos token to the bag, you reveal a new chaos token, and if this effect causes you to fail the test, you shuffle Rex's curse back into your deck. And there's a limit of once per test. Seems to be pretty widely agreed that Rex is the most powerful investigator in the game at the moment, and I would agree with that. A little bit of that is just that the Seeker card pool is really strong, but Rex also has an insanely good special ability. He can suck up clues like no one else in the game, and it's not even limited to once per phase the way some of the other investigator abilities are. That's a little strange, it almost feels like it should be. It's sometimes a little bit jarring to go from using Rex to using another investigator, because once you get used to getting two clues per test, Getting only one starts to feel pretty slow. I enjoy playing as Rex. I will admit that I like Daisy just maybe a little bit more, but that's not because I think she's more powerful. Uh, I just like her theme a little bit better. This expansion's mystic investigator is Jim Culver, the musician. He's got four willpower, three intellect, three combat, and two agility. He has the performer trait, and his main special ability is that he can treat the modifier on skull tokens that he reveals as zeros. While some of the other special chaos tokens typically have effects on top of their numerical modifier, like for example causing you to take a horror or drop a clue, the skull tokens most of the time are just numerical modifiers with no other effects. Not always, but most of the time. So they may count something in the scenario to determine the final modifier, but at the end of the day they're just a number most of the time again. So being able to treat that number as zero means that in most cases those skull tokens aren't going to pose any threat to you as long as your skill is at least even with the difficulty of the test that you're performing. Jim also has a second ability that lets him treat Elder Sign tokens that he draws as skull tokens instead. He was previewed early on and for a while that particular ability was kind of confusing. It was unclear why you would ever want to do that since if you chose not to use it as a skull, it's plus one instead of plus zero. That's the normal Elder Sign effect for Jim, just a plus one modifier. It started to make sense when we got the card Song of the Dead in the first Mythos pack. That card rewards you specifically for drawing the skull token when you use it. Being able to treat the Elder Sign as a skull just increased your odds of triggering that particular effect. Hopefully there'll be other cards like that in the future to continue to add value to Jim. It's not too impactful, but Elder Sign abilities often aren't. Jim's theme is that he has a magic trumpet which allows him to communicate with the dead. That's represented by his signature card, Jim's Trumpet, the Dead Listen. It's a two-cost asset that occupies a hand slot, has a reaction ability that triggers when a skull token is revealed during a skill test. You can exhaust the card to heal one horror from an investigator at Jim's location or at a connecting location. Card also has two willpower icons and a wild icon. It's nice that this triggers off of any skill test. It doesn't have to be one that's performed by Jim or near Jim. It can be anywhere on the map. The healing does, though, require you to be at Jim's location or connected to his location. Then we have Jim's signature weakness, Final Rhapsody. This is a treachery. When you draw it, its revelation effect causes you to reveal five chaos tokens from the chaos bag. Each skull or autofail token that you reveal causes Jim to take one damage and one horror. 
As far as weaknesses go, I actually kind of like this one because it does its thing and then it moves on. Of course, it has the potential to do a fair amount of damage if you get unlucky, and in some cases it may outright defeat you, but most of the time you're probably not looking at hitting more than maybe one or two of these specific tokens. The maximum damage is going to vary depending on your Chaos Bag mix, and we've seen that some campaigns call for more Skull tokens than others uh, in the initial setup. There's always a chance, though, that you'll get lucky with this and just get off completely scot-free, which I think is neat. I have to admit that I don't have a lot of experience playing with Jim. I think I've only used him to play the Carnival of Horror scenario a few times in standalone mode. I think part of the reason is that Jim feels like he's best suited to playing a supporting role in a larger group of investigators, like a full four-player game, and that's above my usual investigator count. With four players, you would have more room for a generalist like Jim, and with four, you would also have more people drawing from the bag, so you would maximize your chances of triggering the healing from his trumpet every round. I'll have to try to run Jim through Dunwich, uh, the full campaign, sometime soon, just to get a little more experience with him. We have a very interesting and popular survivor investigator in Ashcan Pete, the Drifter. Four willpower, two intellect, two combat, and three agility. He has the Drifter trait, and he says that you begin the game with Duke in play. Duke is the dog, and we'll get to him in a second. He has a fast ability that says you can discard a card from your hand to ready an asset you control, limit once per round. Now, a lot of assets don't care about being exhausted. Some of them do. It's usually cards that exhaust in order to trigger a particular ability. Ashcan has an Elder Sign effect that gives plus two to the test and allows him to ready Duke. He has six health and five sanity. You may notice that his stat line and his health and sanity pool are a little bit lower than what most investigators get. His stats add up to 11, for example, and most investigators get 12. It's a little lower just to balance out the fact that he always starts with Duke in play. So let's go ahead and take a look at Duke. Duke, Loyal Hound, is an asset. He's got a printed resource cost of two, but that really doesn't matter unless he somehow gets returned to your hand or he gets shuffled into your deck, uh, since he does start each game in play and you don't have to pay that resource cost normally. He's got two action abilities. The first one lets you take an action and exhaust him to fight. You attack with a base combat skill of four instead of Ashcan's normal two, and the attack deals plus one damage. The other ability allows you to exhaust him to investigate, and investigate with a base intellect of 4, again compared to Ashcan's 2. You may move to a connecting location before you start that investigation. Also has 2 health and 3 sanity. This is an amazing signature card, and really it's the core of this investigator's whole identity. People occasionally joke that Duke is the investigator and Ashcan is the sidekick, which is really not too far off. Duke's combat ability means you always have what's basically a weapon in play from the very start of each scenario, with no need to worry about finding the card or paying for it or taking the time to play it. Then his ability to do a combined investigate and move action is fantastic as well. These two abilities together really nail the flavor of a loyal dog. I especially like the investigate action. It's easy to imagine Duke sniffing forward on the trail of some scent, dragging Pete along behind him. The only issue is you do need to protect Duke and keep him alive, or else your Pete is going to be pretty hobbled for the rest of the scenario. Pete's signature weakness is Racked by Nightmares. This is a treachery. The Revelation effect exhausts all assets you control, and then you put it into play in your threat area. Assets you control cannot ready while this is in your threat area, and it takes two actions for you to discard it. So it really shuts you out from using Duke until you deal with it but dealing with it is pretty easy since it doesn't even require a test. Someone did a BGG poll on favorite investigators recently, and Ashcan was the frontrunner. That really doesn't surprise me. I've got to confess here that while I like Ashcan fine, in my plays with him, I've proven to just be a terrible puppy daddy. For some reason, I just cannot take care of this stupid dog. I've had Duke killed, frozen to death with Crypt Chill, and I don't even want to talk about what happened in Blood on the Altar. I admit a lot of these have been my fault, so it's a little embarrassing. It's like it's just been slow from his playstyle to click for me. Doesn't detract from the fact that he's a very interesting and fun investigator design, and everyone else seems to find him easy to play. Dunwich's new rogue investigator is Jenny Barnes, the dilettante. She's got an even stat line, threes all the way across in all four stats. Her special ability allows her to collect one additional resource during each upkeep phase. 
If you draw an elder sign during a test as Jenny, you get plus one for each resource that you have. And she has an 8-7 split on her health and sanity. Jenny's signature card, Jenny's Twin 45s, is a firearm weapon that comes with a variable amount of ammo based on the amount of resources you spend when you play the card. It's a two-handed weapon asset with a cost of X, X again being whatever you want to pay, and then it comes into play with X ammo tokens. As an action, you can spend one of those ammo tokens to fight with a plus two combat bonus and deal plus one damage. It also has two agility icons and a wild icon. The variable ammo thing is neat, and I think that this is a fine weapon if you're lucky enough to draw into it. The fact that it takes up two hands, though, is a downside, and that's probably something that you'll want to plan around when you're building your Jenny deck. Then we have Jenny's signature weakness, Searching for Izzy. So Jenny's backstory is that she's returned to the States in search of her sister, Izzy, who disappeared under mysterious circumstances. So when this card pops up, Jenny latches onto some clue that she imagines is related to her sister's disappearance, and she's compelled to go investigate it. The revelation effect has you attach searching for Izzy to the location furthest from you. Then any investigator at that location can take two actions to do an investigate action, and if they succeed at the test, searching for Izzy is discarded. If you don't get rid of searching for Izzy by the game end, Jenny takes one mental trauma. I really like the flavor on this one. I imagine that as often as not, these clues that Jenny decides she has to go check out are as much the product of her own overactive imagination and desperation as they are actual leads to find your sister. Like Zoe's Smite the Wicked, this one can be hit and miss. You can definitely luck out in certain scenarios and get this attached to a location that's going to get discarded before game end, letting you pretty much ignore it. Uh, other times it can be a real pain, Carnival of Horrors for example, uh, but its worst case scenario, which is just a mental trauma, is not as bad as Smite the Wicked since it can't really impact your performance in the current scenario, can't cause you to lose really. And Jenny's 7 Sanity isn't bad either. She could probably afford to fail this maybe once or twice without really getting too worried. I enjoy playing as Jenny. She's probably my third favorite out of these new Dunwich Investigators. It's fun to just be able to spend money recklessly on things like pumping your skills with talents. I think Jenny gained a lot also as the card pool grew over the course of the Dunwich cycle. One of the ongoing campaigns I was playing over the time Dunwich was being released was a solo Jenny deck. Early on, I found her sort of underwhelming, but by mid-cycle that had turned around, Rogues had picked up several good cards that worked well with Jenny, and I started to enjoy Jenny a lot more. So that's Jenny Barnes, and with Jenny covered, that brings us to the end of the five new investigators. Before we get into the player cards, let's stop and take a look at the expansion's new basic weakness cards. The Dunwich Deluxe Box comes with three new basic weaknesses, and you get two copies of each of them. So that brings the total pool of basic weaknesses up from 10 in the core set, now to 16. I do like having extra variety in weaknesses, so these are nice to have. I do kind of wish, though, that they'd opted to just give you one copy of each of these instead of two. Since the weakness pool, we would assume, is going to continue to grow in future expansions, it doesn't really seem to add much value to have a lot of duplicates in the pool, especially once the overall count of different weaknesses gets higher. I'd really rather have a pool of, for example, 20 different weaknesses than a pool of 30 with 10 duplicates. My guess is that they just wanted to quickly up the overall count of weaknesses, and maybe we will see fewer duplicates in the future. Anyway, let's take a look at these, starting with Internal Injury. Internal Injury is a basic weakness with the Injury trait. Its revelation effect causes you to put it into play in your threat area. At the end of your turn, a forced effect causes you to take one direct damage and for two actions you can discard internal injury. There's also the card Chronophobia, which is the same thing, but it does horror instead of damage, and it has the madness trait instead of the injury trait, and those traits do matter, they get referenced by uh, different effects throughout the game. Personally, I'm not too big of a fan of these two. I think I like the corset weaknesses, Hypochondria and Psychosis a little better. Those are the two that add an extra horror every time you take damage or vice versa. With those, I like that they kind of tempt you into pressing your luck. You can draw it and then think, well, maybe I'm not in too much danger of taking any damage right now, so I can probably afford to leave this card on the table. Maybe you're right, or maybe that comes back to bite you. Chronophobia and Internal Injury take away that unpredictability and just put you on a steady clock. They can also vary a lot in impact depending on how your character's life pool is balanced. A low sanity character like Roland pretty much has to deal with Chronophobia right away, 
while if he gets internal injury, there's a lot less pressure on him to deal with that immediately. So your difficulty ends up swinging quite a bit if you get the one that's wrong for your particular character. I also think that I'm maybe just a little burned out on these because they've shown up a lot in my campaigns. That's not surprising since having two copies of each of these means together these two weaknesses make up about a quarter of the current weakness pool. The third basic weakness is Indebted, and this one is very unique because it has the permanent trait. That means that it does not get shuffled into your deck, but it stays out in play at all times. It has the Flaw trait and says that you start each game with two fewer resources. I think this one's a little polarizing. Some people dislike it either because they think the effect hurts you too much, or thematically they just prefer the anxiety of having weaknesses lurking inside their deck. I kind of like this one, though has a very different feel from any of the other weaknesses. It's not just more of the same. It makes your initial setup a little slower, but then once you get going, you don't have to worry about it. It's also interesting in the context of the Dunwich campaign. Early on, with some of the effects that discard cards off the top of your deck, any weaknesses in your deck have a chance of getting milled away in Dunwich and never affecting you. Indebted isn't affected by that, so if you have it, you miss out on those chances to avoid your weakness. But then as the campaign progresses, there are some effects that start to make those weaknesses in your discard pile into liabilities. So then the advantage moves a little in Indebted's favor. I think that's kind of neat. When I was playing through Dunwich as it was being released, I had a few campaigns with investigators who had this. One campaign had a Daisy with Indebted who was paired with a Zoe. And one of my favorite plays was for Zoe to play a turn one stand together. That event gives both players two resources and two cards. So before Daisy even took her first turn, she was back up to five resources, basically canceling Indebted. I think I managed that at least twice. I like Indebted, and I look forward to seeing other basic weaknesses like it uh, in the future. Let's look next at the new player cards. The Dunwich Legacy Deluxe Expansion contains 21 new player cards. That's four cards for each class, plus one card that's neutral. Of the 21 cards in this pack, 17 are level 0, so the majority of them. Each class, though, does get one card that's either level 1 or level 2, except for the Seekers, all four of their cards are level 0. The neutral card is Kukri. This is a level 0 asset that costs 2 resources. It's a melee weapon that occupies one hand slot, and it's got a fight action that allows you to fight with plus 1 combat. If you succeed, you're allowed to spend one additional action to deal plus one damage for the attack. So in my opinion, the really important part of a weapon in Arkham, what makes a weapon truly a weapon, is bonus damage. You want to deal with enemies in as few actions as possible, and that means dealing more than one damage per attack is really important. Kukri does technically allow you to deal bonus damage, but since it keeps a ratio of one action to one damage, it doesn't really speed you up. It just reduces the number of tests you need to pass. It's almost like it lets you count one success for two attacks. I don't think that's worth the slot, so thumbs down from me for Kukri. Rolling on to the Guardian cards, up first we have Blackjack, a level zero asset that costs one resource. Occupies a hand slot. It's a melee weapon. You can take a fight action with it and get a plus one combat boost. If you perform the attack against an enemy engaged with another investigator and you fail, you deal no damage. So here again, we have a weapon that to me is not really a weapon because it doesn't do bonus damage. Instead, you get a very small combat boost and a guarantee that you won't accidentally injure one of your teammates if you attack an enemy engaged with them and you miss. I don't currently see any reason to run this card, and honestly, even plain old knife seems preferable. I think this card mainly just exists to make a statement about the flavor of the Guardian class. It reminds you that Guardians are interested not only in defeating monsters, but also in keeping their teammates safe. So good for you, Guardians. I applaud your team spirit and your strong moral fiber, but right now, Blackjack is a pass. Now, if you really want to emphasize the Guardian team spirit, then you just name a card Teamwork. So that's what we have for our second Guardian card. This is an event for zero resources. It says that investigators at your location may give or trade any number of item assets, ally assets, or resources among one another. Also has a wild icon. And quick rules note, it has been clarified that you are not allowed to trade any of your investigator's signature items, so Roland can't pass off his 38 special to another investigator, or Zoe can't give away her cross. Teamwork is a pretty fun and interesting card to have available, though I will say that I haven't really ended up using it much. 
It lets you break the rules of the game a little by letting you trade items and allies to investigators who wouldn't normally be able to have them due to their deck building restrictions. The resource trading is also potentially nice, especially if a character on your team tends to accumulate resources, like for example Jenny. I think this probably benefits from a little forethought at the deck building stage, if you can have some specific trades in mind. Our last level 0 guardian card is Taunt. This is an event that costs 1 resource. It's fast, you play it only during your turn, and it allows you to engage any number of enemies at your location. It's also got a willpower and a combat icon. Ordinarily, enemies do engage automatically, but if they are engaged with another investigator, or if they have the aloof trait, then it does require an action to engage them. So this lets you avoid spending any actions in those circumstances. For a long time, I was pretty dismissive of this card. A big part of that was that I got hung up on looking at the best case scenario. The idea that to get the most out of this, you would need to use it to pull more than one enemy. Didn't seem like that scenario would come up too often, especially in two-player, so I didn't see Taunt as particularly worthwhile. What I think I missed, though, is that this card is still fairly useful when you're just pulling a single enemy. Taunt saves you one action on a turn where you're probably going to be trying to bring an enemy down. Because you're locked in combat, that extra action can be pretty impactful. Having a full three actions to attack an enemy instead of just two means that if you're equipped with a weapon and dealing two damage per hit, you may be able to take out a 5 or 6 health enemy in a single turn instead of 2, which keeps it from surviving through the enemy phase and hitting you. So I think this is better than I first thought. Uh, because enemies do engage automatically, though, this is definitely a multiplayer card. It's not completely useless in solo. There are those aloof enemies who don't automatically engage, but there aren't too many of those, and the main one in Dunwich is pretty easy for Guardians to deal with in other ways. Our last Guardian card is actually a level 2 version of Taunt. It adds an agility icon and also lets you draw one card for each enemy that you engage using Taunt. Now we've seen on other cards that the standard price for an upgrade to add a card draw to a card is to experience. There are a couple of cards that do that. Among them, the level 2 version of the card Lucky just adds a card draw. So this card sits above that curve since it will get you at least one card, probably one in most circumstances, but has the chance of drawing you more. It's certainly not bad, but Guardians do have lots of great upgrades competing for attention, so I'm not sure that upgrading Taunt is all that high of a priority. The first of our four Seeker cards is Shortcut. This is a zero resource event that's fast. You play it only during your turn. Choose an investigator at your location and move that investigator to a connecting location. This is just a fantastic card. may not seem like much, but being able to trade a card for a free movement without spending an action or any resources, and it doesn't trigger an attack of opportunity, it's all just extremely useful. It's a great trick to have, and you're almost always going to have a chance to play this. Even the worst case scenario where it just saves you one action on a mundane turn is still fine. I run this card a lot, probably two copies in every Seeker deck at this point, and it's not uncommon even for me to pick this if I'm trying to fill up my five out-of-faction card slots for one of the Dunwich Investigators. This might be my favorite card from the pack. If it's not, it's at least in the top two or three. That's Shortcut. Laboratory Assistant is a level zero ally asset that costs two resources. It's got two abilities. One of them increases your maximum hand size by two whenever you're checking your hand size during the upkeep phase. The other one is a triggered ability that draws you two cards when Lab Assistant enters play. It's got one health, two sanity, and an intellect icon. I actually don't think that the hand size bump on this card is really all that useful at the moment. The base hand limit of eight already seems sort of generous, and ideally you should be playing cards, not accumulating a third of your whole deck in your hand. I think for a time, though, Lab Assistant was okay in Roland decks, just for the two points of sanity. I say for a time because Seeker's got two more low-cost, two-sanity allies over the course of the Dunwich cycle uh, to fill that same slot. And I think that both of those are actually better choices than Lab Assistant, especially for Roland decks. One thing I do like is that this has the science trait, and it wouldn't surprise me if we eventually see the science trait fleshed out as a theme later on. And so maybe one day that'll add some value back to this card. Seeking Answers is a one-cost event that starts an investigate action. If you succeed, instead of discovering a clue at your location, you discover a clue at a connecting location. This card would let you sit at a low shroud location and swipe clues off an adjacent location with a higher shroud value. 
uh, or if there were enemies or some other kind of effect that you were trying to avoid at the connecting location, then this would let you just kind of steal clues out from underneath them. Um, in practice, though, when I've run this, it's pretty much just mostly sat in my hand unused, and eventually I would commit it to a test for its icons. So I haven't really been impressed with seeking answers. And last but certainly not least, we have Strange Solution Unidentified. This is a level zero asset that costs one resource, has an action you can take that uh, triggers an intellect test with a difficulty of four. If you succeed, you discard Strange Solution and draw two cards. You also record in your campaign log that, quote, you have identified the solution. This is a really interesting card in that it offers you almost no benefit when you actually play it. Uh, and the best thing you could say about it is that it's got a wild icon, but certainly the test to draw two cards doesn't put you ahead at all because you've got uh, the action that you spent to put the card into play and then the action that you used for the test, so you could have just used those two actions to draw the cards directly. But it's got this mysterious instruction that when you pass its test, you get this campaign log note. And I should say this was the only reference to discovering the solution that was in this deluxe expansion and for a while afterwards. It's a little odd to talk about it now at this point in time since the cycle's done and we know the solution to the mystery. But when this first came out, there was no indication what that campaign log would actually do and there was a lot of speculation about what exactly it would mean. So it was actually kind of a, a cool, weird thing that really stretched the design space of what was possible in this game. Uh, it's one of several instances we saw in Dunwich of the game coming up with something really fresh and new to put on a player card that you wouldn't have seen in another uh, game of this style. I won't spoil the solution here, but I do cover it in a later video in the series of Dunwich uh, Mythos Pack Spotlights. It looks like, based on the previewed cards from the next Deluxe expansion, that this sort of player card will be a regular feature of the Seeker class. So I'm kind of interested to see where the next one goes and how closely it follows the pattern that was laid down by Strange Solution. Our first Mystic card is a new spell asset, and it's a pretty straightforward one. Clarity of Mind is an asset that costs two resources and occupies an arcane slot, comes with uses, three charges, and as an action you can spend one of those charges to heal one horror from an investigator at your location. I've tried to make this one work, I've included it in a few decks, and it just hasn't proven useful. It's got the same problem that the Guardian card First Aid has. Spending one action per point of healing is just too slow to be effective, and on top of that it also costs you an action just to get Clarity of Mind into play first. One thing that draws me to Clarity of Mind, though, is the fact that it's a spell. I did put one copy in my current Marie deck just to give her another possible outlet for her free spell action if she didn't have an enemy engaged with her. Even there, I think I was pretty quick to upgrade it into something else. I think it got upgraded after the first scenario, actually. Fortunately, there are two other options for healing or managing horror in this same deluxe expansion that I like better than this. We'll get to those soon. There were also some good horror cards that came later in the Dunwich cycle. So not a huge fan of this one. That's Clarity of Mind. Our next Mystic card is another spell asset, Rite of Seeking, and this one's quite a bit better than Clarity. It costs four resources and occupies one of your arcane slots. Comes with uses, three charges. As an action, you can spend a charge to investigate using your willpower instead of your intellect. If you succeed, you discover one additional clue at the location. If a skull, cultist, tablet, elder thing, or tentacle symbol is revealed during the test, then after the test resolves, you lose all your remaining actions and you immediately end your turn. This is another mystic card that lets them sub in their willpower for another stat, a lot like shriveling. This may not be quite as essential to the mystic class as shriveling is. They do have some other options for grabbing clues, including drawn to the flame and for Agnes, look what I found. But even if Rite of Seeking isn't their only choice, it's still a good option. It does have a nasty drawback if you hit a bad token, but you can mitigate that risk just by using this as the last action of your turn. All in all, this is a great card for Mystics to have access to. Ritual Candles is a one-cost asset that occupies a hand slot, has a reaction ability that triggers after a skull, cultist, tablet, or elder thing symbol is revealed during a test you're performing. You get plus one skill value for this test. When this box first came out, I kind of liked Ritual Candles. I think I've sort of cooled off on it, though. It's alright, but I don't think it's essential, and I wouldn't feel bad cutting it from a deck if I ran out of deck space. It's just sort of unreliable, since it doesn't do anything for you on any of the tests where you don't draw those special tokens. The final Mystic card is the Level 2 Bind Monster. This is an event for three resources. 
triggers an evade test, and the evasion attempt uses willpower instead of agility. If you succeed and the enemy is non-elite, then you evade it and attach bind monster to it. It has a reaction ability that triggers any time the attached enemy would ready. You test willpower with a difficulty of 3, and if you succeed, the attached enemy does not ready. If you fail, you discard bind monster. So as long as you can keep passing a 3 difficulty willpower test every round, you can keep a non-elite enemy from ever refreshing. I don't really have any experience using this. It's never looked that appealing to me. It seems like sooner or later you're going to miss on that test and it's going to drop the enemy back in your lap. I guess if you're using this late in the scenario, there's a better chance it may hold for the rest of the game. But still, I prefer just getting enemies off the board entirely, and as Agnes, between her innate damage ability and shriveling, that's usually not that hard, especially with non-elite enemies. First up for survivors is Fire Axe. This is a level 0 asset that costs 1 resource. It's a one-handed melee weapon. You can take a fight action with it, and if you have no resources in your resource pool, that attack deals plus 1 damage. It also has a fast trigger, where during an attack using Fire Axe, you can spend one resource to get plus two combat for the test, and there's a limit of three times per attack. So you can get two, four, or six by spending one, two, or three resources. So Fire Axe is pretty much the weapon of choice for survivors, and even gets used as an out-of-faction choice by some non-survivors as well. I splashed this into Zoe as a backup weapon, and I think that's fairly common, though that may only last until Guardians get another suitable level zero weapon. I use it in Agnes, too, in case Shriveling doesn't turn up. It can give, like I said, up to a plus 6 boost, which is pretty big, and makes it possible for even low combat characters to land a hit, as long as they have enough cash to spend. It does give you a hoop to jump through for its damage bonus, but I think it's turned out to be pretty easy to make that work. And I guess I should qualify what I said about bonus damage earlier. While it's absolutely vital for primary fighters to do more than one damage, in an action. For a non-fighter, just being able to land a one damage hit in an emergency is still useful. So all in all, Fire Axe is an excellent card. Bait and Switch is a level zero event. For one resource, it starts an evade test, and if you succeed, if the enemy is not elite, then you evade it and move it to a connecting location. I had this card in a deck in one of my Dunwich campaigns, and I have to say I really don't remember getting a lot of use out of it. I think most of the time it ended up getting committed to tests and not actually played for its effect. I do remember one time when it shifted a really nasty non-hunter enemy out of the way in one of my later Dunwich scenarios. Uh, that kept me from having to deal with that enemy, but that was kind of narrow. Uh, most of the time, I think, especially against hunter enemies, this is probably not particularly effective. It does have a fun piece of artwork, though. The monster sneaking up on this uh, actually pretty well-constructed ragdoll dummy that's got a hat and a scarf sitting in this rocking chair. So I like the art, but not the card. Survivor's last level zero card is the local football star Peter Silvestri. His subtitle is Big Man on Campus. He is an ally asset that costs three resources, gives you a plus one bonus to your agility, and he's also got a reaction ability that triggers when you're or after your turn ends, and heals one horror off of him. Uh, he's got one health and two sanity, also has a willpower icon. Let's go ahead and also look at the level two version of this card, also in this box. The difference is here is that it adds an additional plus one willpower, uh, and his sanity goes from two to three. So both versions of Peter have this self-healing thing going on where at the end of every turn he'll shed a horror. That alone is a pretty nice ability, but add that to the fact that you get boost to one or with a leveled up version, two different stats, and you have a just fantastic ally, especially the level two version. Those boosts don't have any conditions attached to them, which is nice. This is one of my favorite survivor cards, and it's often one of the first upgrades I purchase uh, going from the level zero to the level two version. I really like him in Agnes. You'll still be putting horror on Agnes to trigger her ability, but Peter ensures that she doesn't waste any uses of her ability if she has to take horror when she doesn't have an enemy to damage. Instead, she can put the unneeded horror on him, and he'll recover it and be ready to take more later. The willpower boost from the level 2 version is also really nice for Agnes. Uh, together with Fire Axe, he makes this a very nice expansion for the Survivor class. Sticking with the theme of healing horror, let's go over to Liquid Courage in the Rogue class. This is a level 0 asset that costs 1 resource comes into play with four supply tokens on it. As an action, you can spend one of those supply tokens to choose an investigator at your location to heal one horror. Then that investigator tests willpower with a difficulty of two. 
If that test succeeds, he or she heals one additional horror. If that test fails, he or she discards one card at random from his or her hand. I think this card's alright, although I admit I've mostly used it with one specific investigator, and that's as an out-of-faction splash for Zoe, usually just a single copy. I mentioned with clarity of mind that one action for one point of healing is too slow. This gets you two points per action, assuming you pass the test, and while it's somewhat inefficient, still, it seems to be enough to make it work. The willpower test does limit who can use this effectively, but Zoe, with her four willpower, handles it pretty well, at least on standard. I've had times where this has pulled Zoe back from the brink of defeat and kept her in the game long enough for the win. Now, all that said, I built the Zoe decks I'm talking about at the beginning of the Dunwich Cycle. We do have more options for healing, uh, healing Horn now at the end of the Dunwich Cycle. The card, if it bleeds in particular from Undimensioned and Unseen, is in faction for Zoe and fits her playstyle. So building today, Liquid Courage might not make the cut. I could still see this working in the right circumstances, though, like maybe as support for a group of investigators who have generally high willpowers. So maybe it slipped a little, but I still like the card. Think on Your Feet is a one-resource event. It's fast, and you play it when an enemy would spawn at your location. Immediately move to a connecting location while the enemy still spawns at your previous location. For some reason, when I think of this card, I think of it as being related to Bait and Switch, which we looked at just a little bit ago even though really they're fairly distinct. I think it's just because they're both in the same expansion and they're both somewhat similar effects in that they help you distance yourself away from an enemy. But Think on Your Feet is really a much better card. The fact that this is fast makes a big difference, as does the fact that it doesn't require you to pass a skill test. This basically gets you a very situational free movement action. It's not as flexible as Shortcut or even Elusive, but I still think it's fairly useful. And I think at least once I've even chosen this as an out-of-faction splash for one of the Dunwich Investigators. So that's Think on Your Feet. Up next is the skill card, Double or Nothing. This skill has a single wild icon. You can only commit one of these to a skill test. Double the difficulty of this skill test. If this skill test is successful, resolve the effects of the successful test twice. This is definitely among my favorite cards in this expansion. I love it because it generates memorable moments. I find the best use to usually be on attacks, whether that's from a big weapon or a damage dealing event like Backstab. You add a vicious blow to the mix and suddenly you're taking a huge chunk of a boss out in a single action. A double or nothing Backstab with a level zero vicious blow committed, that's eight damage. And you can get even crazier than that though. The one downside is that there's no way to commit double or nothing for its icon without triggering that doubling effect. Sometimes I'll be holding this without a good test in sight to use it on, and I'll start to wish I could just get a wild out of it. But that's a pretty small price to pay for the amazing moments that you can get out of this. So again, one of my favorite cards in this expansion, Double or Nothing. Another one that I will often include as an out-of-faction splash for a Dunwich Investigator. And our very last player card is Hired Muscle. This is a level 1 asset that costs 1 resource. He occupies your ally slot, gives you plus 1 to combat, and there's a forced effect that requires you at the end of the upkeep phase to either pay one resource or discard him from play. He's got three health, one sanity, and a combat icon. So sort of a delayed payment deal going on with this card. Cheap to get out, but expensive in the long run if you let him stick around. I don't see a lot of need for this guy, especially with him costing an experience point and hogging that all-important ally slot. The high health is sort of nice for only one resource, but I don't think it's enough to redeem him. And finally, let's talk about the new scenario content in this box. If you don't already know how the Arkham expansion cycles are structured, the Dunwich Legacy Deluxe expansion box is the start of a new campaign by that same name, the Dunwich Legacy. The full campaign runs for eight scenarios, and two of those scenarios, Extracurricular Activity and The House Always Wins, are inside this deluxe box. The remaining six scenarios in the Dunwich campaign are spread out over six smaller Mythos Pack expansions. In addition to those first two scenarios, the Deluxe Box also has several new encounter sets that are used repeatedly over the course of the Dunwich campaign. So each scenario has some cards that are specific to that one scenario, but all the scenarios and counter decks are rounded out using some of these encounter sets from the Deluxe Box, plus one or more encounter sets from the core set. So the encounter sets sort of give an overall mechanical flavor to the campaign. That does mean that you have to have the Dunwich Legacy Deluxe Expansion plus the core set in order to play any of the scenarios in those six Dunwich Mythos packs. 
An interesting wrinkle in the Dunwich campaign is that when you start your campaign, the two scenarios in this box can be played in either order. You can start with extracurricular activity and do the House Always Wins second, or you can mix it up and do the House Always Wins first and extracurricular second. The scenarios each play a little bit differently depending on the order you choose, which is kind of neat and adds a little bit of variety when you replay the campaign. I should note that the rest of the Dunwich campaign follows a fixed order. It's only these first two scenarios that let you switch it around. In my opinion, Extracurricular Activity and The House Always Wins are both excellent scenarios, both in their gameplay and in their theming. I think as a pair, they're fairly even in quality. There's not one of the two that I think is significantly better than the other, and I think which one I would pick as my favorite has even slid back and forth between the two scenarios over time. In terms of story, theme, and immersion, I think the Dunwich Box scenarios represent a nice step up in quality from the corset experience. And in terms of gameplay, I think these scenarios are both better than two out of the three scenarios in the corset, with the excellent Midnight Masks still edging them out. Let's talk about each scenario specifically now. Extracurricular activity is set on the campus of the Miskatonic University, sort of after hours. That's a location we've already visited in the corset, though there it was just a single location card. Here it's fleshed out as a whole little campus for you to explore. This scenario is really an introduction to the mechanical themes and encounter sets that reoccur throughout the Dunwich Cycle. It doesn't use all of the sets, but it uses the ones that I think of the most when I think of the overall feel of the Dunwich campaign. I want to say that this is the plainest or most normal of the Dunwich scenarios, meaning there's no huge twist to the gameplay. That's not a knock against it though, I think it's a good way to start the campaign, and it's still a well-crafted and very enjoyable scenario. It does handle its resolution in an interesting way, in that it offers the players multiple different endings to pursue, and there's not one right answer for which goal to choose. The other scenario, The House Always Wins, is much more unique from a mechanical standpoint. While it does introduce a few of the Dunwich Legacy's other encounter sets, unlike extracurricular activity, it doesn't really preview the recurring themes of the campaign so much. Instead, it's more of its own unique challenge, and I think challenge is the right word, at least in my opinion and in my experience, this is one of the tougher scenarios in the whole Dunwich campaign. It's set inside a secret gambling hall in Speakeasy, and it's themed as more of a social type of investigation, at least in part. That social feel is done by playing around with how the scenario handles both enemies and clue gathering. On top of exploring how to portray that social style of conflict, the scenario also really embraces its gambling theme, and it evokes it in a handful of different ways, some of which I think are pretty clever. What I think I like most about these scenarios, both of them, is how effectively they pin theme and story elements to their game text. Arkham as a whole is really good at this, but I feel like these scenarios stepped it up a level from what was in the core set. I don't want to get into spoilers, but there are a few moments in both of these scenarios that I really love because of how well they tell the story using really just game instructions. Sometimes you don't even need the story text. So overall, I'm very satisfied with the two scenarios in this box. It's pretty easy really to recommend this expansion anyway since it's required to play all the other scenarios in the Dunwich campaign, but I really do think that the two scenarios in this box make for a very enjoyable experience. And that's it for our look at the Dunwich Legacy Deluxe expansion. If you've made it to the end here, thanks for watching. For more on the Dunwich Legacy expansion cycle, you can check out my Mythos Pack Spotlight videos where I cover the rest of the cycle's releases, starting with the spotlight video for the first Mythos pack, the Miskatonic Museum. If you enjoy this series, then don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel, and you can also visit the Atlas Agency blog over at atlasofarkham.wordpress.com. Thanks again!